Hey, man. Hey. What's up? Oh, nothing really. You know, just thinking. Cool. Cool. Have you ever thought about the forces climbers experience during a fall? Well, not until now. Well, they can be pretty severe. But here's the really weird thing. Say a climber falls from two metres above their anchor point to where the rope becomes taut two metres below their anchor point, totaling a four metre fall. The impact force they feel during that fall would be the same as if they were to fall from five metres above their anchor point to five metres below their anchor point, totaling a ten metre fall. Wait, 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 what? A 10 meter fall would result in the same force as a 4 meter fall. I know, right? Anyway, I know you're busy. I didn't mean to disturb. I'll, uh, I'll leave you to it. And he's gone. He's gone. Right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does not need to be thought about right now. You need to focus and get back to planning your next video. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. It does not need to be thought about right now. <sighs> Hi folks, my name is Kieran. And yes, today we're going to be talking about the counterintuitiveness of climbing falls. Would you believe me if I were to tell you that the impact force felt by a climber due to a fall is independent of the height exclusively from which they fell? Sounds ludicrous, right? Well, let's first start by understanding some key mechanics of the life-saving part of the scenario, the rope. Let's imagine we're in a tug of war. When we pull on either end of the rope, the rope gets put under tension. This applies a stress on the rope, one of the more aptly named mechanical phenomena. The stress depends on the force with which you pull it, the more you pull, the more stress it's under, and its cross-sectional area. The thinner the rope, the less you'd have to pull to snap it, and vice versa. But that's not all. As a result of the stress that it's under, you can imagine that the rope is going to want to give a little and stretch. And to give this stretch comparable meaning, we talk about it as strain, which is the ratio of how much it stretches to its original length. Now typically, the stress and strain of material remains linear for relatively small strains, and it's because of this that we can define a constant material property called the elastic modulus, or Young's modulus which is the ratio of a material stress to its strain before it yields and starts stretching a lot more. So with all that information, we can then predict the tensile force in a rope, given how much it's stretched by, say length y. And that is that the force within the rope, the tensile force in the rope is equal to the elastic modulus multiplied by its cross-sectional area all over its original length all multiplied by the stretch y. This is an important equation because it tells us the tensile force in the rope depends on its original length. To demonstrate this, I cut two different lengths of string from the same spool, one being short and one being long. I then hung the same weight out of both strings and measured their extensions. As you can see, the longer string extended more under the same force than the shorter one. And as expected, the ratio of their extension to their original length, or in other words, their strain, are equal to one another. So to clarify that intuition, a shorter rope will stretch less under the same force than a longer rope will. Now onto the scenario at hand. Say we have a climber, a height of h over 2 above their last anchor point, so that when they fall past that anchor point to where the rope becomes taut and catches them, they'll have fallen a total height of twice that, being h. 
and we'll assume that they've clipped through multiple anchor points zigzagging across the rock so there is a sufficient amount of friction in the system implying that the effective stretchable rope length available to them is the length from them to that anchor point. We'll call this length L0, which in this case is half the height of the fall. Since the climber isn't going to be gaining huge amounts of velocity during the fall, we can safely assume that the drag force due to air resistance on the climber is negligible. Therefore, the only forces acting on the climber during the fall are the climber's weight, mg, and the force in the rope, f. These two forces are conservative forces, meaning their corresponding energies depend only on the starting and ending positions of the climber. This tells us that the energy of the climber throughout the fall must remain constant, or in other words, the energy of the climber throughout the fall must be conserved. Therefore, the energy at the start of the fall must equal the energy of the climber at the end of the fall. So let's use the conservation of energy to our advantage. Let's say that the position of the climber where the rope just begins to tighten is our datum. Now the climber is initially at a height h above this datum and at the instant where they begin to fall only the force of gravity is acting on them. As they fall they lose gravitational potential energy and gain kinetic energy to the point where the rope begins to tighten and all of that gravitational potential energy has gone into kinetic energy at which point the rope begins to stretch and the kinetic energy is then converted into elastic energy but because of that stretch they've now dropped below our datum and have lost a further bit of gravitational potential energy as an equation this is what we have we have the total energy at the start is equal to the total energy at the end now using the equation that we talked about earlier of the stretch of a rope to its tension force we can rewrite it like this which gives us a lovely quadratic, which when solved for the maximum force, F max, gives that as this. Now some of you might be sat there thinking, hang on a second, you said the force on the climber is independent of the height from which they fell. And yet I can clearly see the variable of height, H, in the equation there. And yes, you're right, you're absolutely right, the variable of height is actually in the equation. But notice that it's in a ratio with the amount of rope available to the climber, L0. And those two are not independent of one another. The higher you climb, the more rope you're going to need. This ratio, in climbing terms, is called the fall factor. And in the case we've been talking about, where the amount of stretchable rope available to the climber is half that of the total fall height, then we have a fall factor of two, which in the majority of climbing scenarios is the maximum it can ever be. What this tells us then is that for a fall factor of two, you could be talking about somebody that has fallen four meters with a rope length of two meters, or somebody who has fallen 10 meters with a rope length of five meters. I mean, you could go as far to say that there are infinitely many ratios of fall heights to rope lengths giving the same fall factor of two, all resulting in the same impact force. I find that so oddly remarkable. But the thing to remember to help with the intuition is that a shorter rope will stretch less under the same force than a longer rope will. Thinking about that makes it slightly more intuitive. Slightly. Thanks very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a lot and it encourages me to keep creating curious content like this for you. You can find me on socials at Kieran WA McAvoy. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.